our first speaker is Hannington Amol, who is the chief executive of the East Africa Law Society, and he will be uh, making the opening remarks on behalf of EELS. Hannington. Thank you so much, Yasmin. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased once again uh, to meet you. It's quite unfortunate that uh, due to the current situation that the entire world is dealing with, we are not able to come to Dar es Salaam or Arusha or Mwanza as we had earlier planned. This is not the first time that East Africa Law Society, FOID, ZLS and TLS are combining efforts to bring to you a capacity building session on business and human rights. To my recollection, this should actually be the third session which we had planned to be in person. Hopefully, sometimes, early ne early, uh, sometimes next year, we will be able to have an in-person meeting. We thank FOID and Roll UK for holding our hands into these very recent developments in the practice of law and how, how corporates do business in, in our region. And I also thank uh, Zanzibar Law Society led by President Slim, uh, as well as Tanganyika Law Society led by CEO Caleb Gamaya and President Dr. Nshala for partnering with us to ensure that our members and the legal profession at large in Tanganyika and Zanzibar Island are brought to speed with quite recent developments. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the reason why as East Africa Law Society we are really interested in this area of business and human rights is essentially that responsible develop business goes to the roots of rule of law into sustainable developments and eventually they determine what us as lawyers really have to do to ensure that there's justice across all sectors. It doesn't matter what side of the divide we are on, whether you are working as a state council on the government side, whether you are working as a corporate council, in-house council in a corporation, whether you are working in an NGO, or whether you are working as a private practitioner or even academic, you have a role to play in ensuring justice. Business and human rights, and we abbreviate as responsible uh, business, basically strives to ensure that for every sphere where corporations are doing business or having operations, then they respect minimum standards. This could be anti-slavery, ensuring that people get pay for what they work for, ensuring that communities have a say on how resources, natural resources within their localities are exploited, ensuring fair compensation for land acquisition and land use, ensuring that environmental contamination is kept at minimum and redress is granted where possible, including ensuring cleaning up. Tanzania has the unique position in the region that it has a well-developed extractive uh, industry. And while this contributes to overall sustainability of Tanzania's uh, economic and social development, there are concerns uh, about the role of communities. There, when you go down, to Gaita, when you go to Singida, where the mines are located, Mwanza, there are real concerns about whether local communities are participating in those developments. There are issues about wages. There are issues about contamination of water sources. There are issues about disposal of eventual mineral waste coming from the mines. And these are the questions that business and human rights seek to address. So I would like you to keep an open mind uh, consider this basically just an overview of what BHR is. But even with the overview, we expect that you are going to develop keen interest and, and help the community to really participate in how local resources are utilized. I know we are going to interact much. Uh, open your minds, speak up uh, where you think the speakers may have missed something on this particular set of Tanzania, feel free to raise it, especially when we go to the breakout sessions. May I now welcome you to this session. Thank you. Our next speaker um, who will be making the opening remarks is the president of Zanzibar Law Society, Slim Abdallah, who I know is with us and we're delighted that has joined us here today. So um, Slim, can I ask you to say a few words? Hello, the president of Zanzibar Law Society, 
the Bar Association of Zanzibar in South Africa. Uh, thank you to each and uh, every one of you for being here today. I feel to be privileged to be given this opportunity to talk and welcome you today on this precious event which puts uh, together the two disciplines of law and business, but in a very, very ethical modality. It is my expectation that this event will provide the deep thoughts on the necessity to, of, of balance between the way the people and entities are conducting their daily transactions and earn their revenues which adhere to the ethics uh, laws and other uh, guiding principles placed for better welfare of the people and universe. I would like to express my sincere appreciation to everyone, uh, an individual who generously helped in making this event happen today. I don't want to take too much of your time and kindly, kindly let me uh, take this opportunity to welcome every one of you and wishing you a good participation and learning. Thank you all for listening and wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed um, from us as well. Um, and now on to our main speakers. I'm really delighted to welcome Stuart Neely, who is the Senior Associate at Norton Rose Fulbright. Stuart will be focusing on the UN guiding principles of business and human rights within the context of international legal frameworks for responsible business. Stuart. Thank you, Yasmin. Uh, Thomas, I wonder if you could share my slides. Uh, have you got yeah. those up? Oh, thank you very much. Uh, hi, hi, everyone. Um, so as uh, Yasmin said, I'll be really focusing on in the next 10 minutes, which is not a lot of time at all, on the international legal framework on responsible business, which, which is really evolving quite quickly. Um, the principal focus uh, is the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, which I'll introduce um, here at this slide. If there is a central point, which I can convey in, in the next 10 minutes, um, it's that the UN guiding principles um, require businesses to reflect on and identify their adverse human rights impacts. Now those adverse human rights impacts could occur in a business's own operations, or indeed in connection with their business uh, relationships, uh, which as Yasmin mentioned, uh, would include, for example, uh, businesses working in, in a business's supply chain. So um, there is a distinction here, and this is, this is a key point to be drawn between voluntary corporate social responsibility initiatives, which, although valuable, um, may not necessarily, uh, without a business applying the UN guiding principles, um, result in a business identifying their adverse human rights impacts. So it's important to understand how the UN guiding principles are mutually supporting of the UN sustainable development goals, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, but distinct. And the key distinction really is that the 17 um, UN sustainable development goals uh, make clear that there is a role for business um, in furthering the, the SDGs. So whether that's um, reducing poverty and creating employment or um, developing key infrastructure, which also reduces um, poverty. Um, businesses should not, uh, in doing those activities, uh, make use of abusive labour practices or indeed um, damage the environment. And the UN Guiding Principles is the authoritative um, international uh, framework uh, which um, is, is, is broadly accepted in the international community and, and it derives its authority from the fact that in 2011, the UN Human Rights Council um, unanimously endorsed the UN Guiding Principles. Um, and in the six years leading up to the promulgation of the UN Guiding Principles, um, the UN team led by Professor John Ruggie that formulated the Guiding Principles um, involved uh, a wide, made use of a wide stakeholder engagement process which involved businesses, government and civil society. Um, and that really is why the UN Guiding Principles is the most authoritative framework. 
and the principles are built on these three pillars. Um, the first is a recognition that states have a primary duty to protect human rights, to protect individuals um, from human rights abuses. Um, and that, that, that obligation derives from the international treaties which states have signed up to, as well as um, certain principles of international, um, customary international law. Businesses, on the other hand, have what we call the corporate responsibility to respect human rights. That's the second pillar of, of the guiding principles. Um, now, how businesses discharge that responsibility to respect human rights is through carrying out human rights due diligence. And I'll come on to explain what that means very shortly. And as I said, that extends not just to the business itself, but also its commercial relationships. So joint ventures, customers, subsidiaries and, and suppliers and the like. The third pillar is, is, the, is remedy, which is that um, victims of adverse human rights abuses should have access to remedy. Um, and, and that can be judicial or non-judicial. Um, and by, by the non-judicial aspect, what I mean is that businesses themselves can implement fair and transparent processes whereby people who are adversely affected by their activities can obtain remedy. And the UN Guiding Principles and UN Guiding Principle 31 set out what a fair and transparent process should be for a grievance mechanism. Thomas, can you move to the next slide? Thank you. So this is human rights due diligence at a very high level. This is really a snapshot of what human rights due diligence is. And because we only have limited time, uh, I would definitely encourage everyone to go and read UN Guiding Principles 17 to 21, um, because that really encapsulates what human rights due diligence is. Distilling those principles into these four steps. Um, the first is, is perhaps the most important point, which is that um, businesses cannot properly be doing human rights due diligence and mitigating their human rights impacts unless they've gone through the process of identifying what their actual and potential human rights impacts are. To do that effectively involves making sure that you have the right level of expertise um, and also a devotion of sufficient resource to help you understand as a business what your human rights impacts are. And when you talk about that expertise, you're not necessarily just talking about having internal expertise within the company or making use of the company's lawyers. And obviously a lot of the focus of today is on the role of lawyers, but also knowing that quite often NGOs, particularly local NGOs in the communities um, where the business is operating um, and trade unions um, and, and those sorts of um, civil society actors quite often have a very good idea of, of potentially how a business is, is, is impacting on the people and communities around it. Um, so that really is uh, what you might call the, the, the information or the inputs, as it were, which allows a business to then go and assess where, where its potential human rights impacts are. And unless you're doing that, you're not doing human rights due diligence under the guiding principles, which is why there is this distinction between, say, voluntary corporate social responsibility initiatives and due diligence under the guiding principles. Because as I said, you know, whilst a business might well be creating jobs, at the same time, it might not be paying um, proper wages, sufficient wages for their, for their workers to, um, to, to live properly. And that in itself would, would be a contravention of um, human rights principles, for example, under the ILO conventions. And this is the process by which a business can go and identify that issue. Um, so then once you've identified your human rights issues, the next thing you have to do is prioritize those which are the most severe. Um, and the most severe human rights impacts involves that assessment process of, of recognizing that a business will have finite resource. Um, a business might have many potential human rights impacts, but the most severe impacts um, should be those which are certainly prioritized to make sure that the business avoids them, um, certainly to the extent possible. And when you're dealing with gross human rights abuses, so those which you know, affect the right to life or potentially involve torture or inhumane degrading treatment, um, they have to be avoided entirely. They have to be stopped. Um, and as lawyers, part of the reason for that is um, we recognize that quite often um, human rights abuses um, are also legal abuses and breaches of the law. 
Um, so um, guiding principle 23 is a very useful um, document, uh, a very useful principle for you to look at, which sets out the importance of acknowledging that if you're dealing with um, certain gross human rights abuses, um, it, it's not just a case of mitigating them, but also um, ceasing them, uh, ceasing the conduct which infringes on, on those rights. Um, and as a minimum, uh, businesses should comply with the local law and then also under the guiding principles, the international human rights, um, which are engaged um, as per the company's own human rights due diligence process. Um, then um, you have to track the effectiveness, the, the effectiveness rather of the steps that you're taking to manage and mitigate those human rights impacts. Um, this involves a process of looking at your um, human rights due diligence um, and seeing whether it's fit for purpose. Um, because the human rights due diligence that you carried out last year as a business might not reflect your current human rights issues. And also the steps that you took to mitigate human rights impacts may or may not have been effective. And if they weren't effective, what do you need to do to make sure that they are effective? Um, and that tracking effectiveness um, process is critical and, and is often quite ignored, um, as is the final aspect of human rights due diligence, which is communicating externally. Um, the, the, the key principle behind this is transparency um, and the businesses um, that carry out uh, human rights due diligence um, the best um, quite often publish reports externally about the steps they're taking to mitigate the human rights impacts against the UN guiding principles. So there's a, refor a reporting framework which has been developed by a team of people who used to work with John Ruggie which allows businesses to assess how, they're, um, how they are um, acting in accordance with the UN guiding principles and then report externally. Um, could I get the next slide, please, Thomas? Thank you. So this slide um, shows how um, the UN guiding principles um, are filtering into and impacting on um, domestic and national law, as well as uh, regional and international initiatives. So I might start with the law and, and domestic law. There's a selection of, of laws there. Those which I've italicized, so in Switzerland and in Canada, are not yet law and are on the process towards um, becoming law. Um, the, the Swiss initiative um, has been in the Swiss legislat legislature for a number of years um, and has now been put to a referendum, um, but it is quite close to becoming law. Um, I don't have time to address all of these laws, but um, it is important for the purposes of understanding how these laws are being developed, that there's a different focus and emphasis. Um, some focus on reporting um, and others actually require the performance of due diligence. Um, on that note, the most important um, development we've had perhaps this year is that the EU announced in April this year that they plan to publish, uh, the EU uh, plans to publish a European-wide, so across the EU, mandatory human rights due diligence law with a proposal to be announced um, in early 2021. Now, how that law will look um, is not quite clear at this stage, but what is clear is that it is likely to be cross-sectoral um, and it is also likely to involve sanctions. There's also a prospect of a business and human rights treaty um, that has gone through a number of drafts. The third draft has just been published. Um, but the key is that the, the, the new emphasis on the human rights treaty, the business and human rights treaty in this draft is human rights due diligence insofar as it now pro provides for the potential that states, um, if this treaty were ever to become um, international law, would require businesses to conduct human rights due diligence. Um, and then finally, we have the multi-stakeholder initiatives and, and other frameworks. Um, I will just pick one example here, which is the uh, Equator Principles, which were revised and the new Equator Principles 4 comes in in October this, this year, so very shortly. And that has a greater emphasis on the importance of human rights. The Equator Principles is uh, a framework which the largest financial institutions have signed up to um, and apply when uh, lending funds in connection with project finance. And a key aspect now is that principle two, 
um, of the equator principles requires businesses who are taking funding or, or, or borrowing funds from uh, the equator principle signatory banks to incorporate human rights, the human rights assessment process um, in connection with all projects and to, to document that analysis as well. So that really highlights how the UN guiding principles are uh, slowly being promulgated into different laws, regional developments and international initiatives. Um, unfortunately, because I've only got 10 minutes, I don't really have time to, to go into detail with, with these, but I know that when we break out into the group sessions, uh, we're going to focus on some of these laws and discuss the pros and cons and the different approaches. Um, so for example, comparing the UK Modern Slavery Act, uh, which is a reporting requirement with the French duty of vigilance law, which requires certain French businesses to uh, publish and, and implement uh, vigilance plans, which take into account uh, companies' human rights impacts. Um, I think that's probably where I'll leave it, and I look forward to having that discussion. Thank you very much indeed, Stuart. Um, that was really very interesting and thought-provoking. Um, so going on to then our next speaker. Um, our next speaker is uh, Flaviana Charles, who is the Executive Director of Business and Human Rights Tanzania. She will address the corporate responsibility in respect to respect and will do so by looking at the role of the lawyers in ensuring a responsible corporate response in respect to mitigation of legal risk and also importantly reputational risk. So um, I will start well the a little bit of explanation of um, what does uh, what does corporate responsibility to respect mean. I've just structured um, the um, the presentation to uh, the number two sides. Number one is going to be about the introduction part, and the number two will be about the um, the mitigation, especially on the legal risk, international risk, reputational risk. So to start with um, uh, the introduction part, um, corporates on corporate social, um, corporate um, responsibility to respect. I just given a little bit of explanation that um, it simply means um, that the business enterprises should be, uh, should avoid infringing on the human rights of others and should address adverse human rights impacts with, with which they are involved. So we expect that um, when the company are being within a certain jurisdiction, then they got to be responsible um, to what they have caused, especially on infringement of human rights of all the people, of the third people, uh, third party. So they should be able to address those kind of human rights violations. But also I spoke, um, I've just put on the issue of the companies or business must know, and must know and show the respect for human rights through exercising human rights due diligence. We all know that um, for the company to avoid human rights violations, it's quite important to undertake the human rights due diligence so that they can be able to mitigate um, the impacts for future uh, uh, generations and for, for, uh, for other people who are third party to that organization, to that business. So we expect them when they kill up human rights, they, they undertake the human rights due diligence. We believe that this will be able to reduce to a great extent the violation of human rights. And um, I went straight to the issues of mitigation of the um, legal and reputation risk. And uh, when I was checking on legal risk, risk is, I actually checked on the um, different scenario. The number one, which is quite important actually, and I think is really important to take into account, is to ensure that the non-judicial and judicial mechanism is available and accessible to all. Uh, we have seen in different scenarios, particularly, uh, I can talk for Tanzania, where we have this mechanism in place, but uh, a lot of people cannot access them. First, number one, because of its vigorous process to assess them, but also the, um, the, the, availability, uh, the availability of those mechanisms. So I spoke directly about the having this mechanism available but accessible and um, to all without uh, legalities to their title, the status of the people, they should be able to assess 
easily and make sure that they, they, they make use of those mechanisms. But also, as I talked about, the, to ensure the business adapt the policies and the human rights strategies to avoid the impact of non compliance and the human rights abuse. Um, adapting policies and human rights strategies in place actually is kind of mitigation factor because it, it makes them to be, um, I don't like to say that to play green card, being a good, but it makes them to be in a good position to address those issues which can be detrimental to, um, to people and hence the violation of human rights or leading to human rights abuse. So I thought that with most of the organization I worked with, uh, made a research on, they lack this kind of policies and the strategies to ensure that they address the human rights violations. But also, they present the clients, lawyers, um, this, uh, because we're talking about the law, checking on the, uh, the law, we're talking about the law of lawyers. The law of lawyers now, uh, apart from what I've mentioned, but they have to be in a position to represent clients on remedial redress. Because um, if the lawyers are in place to address, they know, they have much knowledge, they have a better knowledge on the human rights and business. They're going to be able to help these uh, clients, especially in a house council who are working within the organization. They can be able to advise, uh, to advise the company and the businesses to address human rights violations, but also to have their strategies in place and ensure that they have the policies which are, are less possible to, needs, uh, to the needs of community members. But also um, the, the, the advocates, uh, the, uh, the lawyers, uh, in-house counsel as well, they can, uh, even in the issues of land, they can uh, help the community members to get, uh, to, get to, uh, to obtain their full, uh, full fair and prompt compensation. We've been having this kind of scenario, particularly in Tanzania, where people get the conversation, but, it, um, but also it's not fair, Sometimes we have a lot of complaint about the, the how that compensation is prompt. We have the cases where the assessment is done today and the compensation is being paid after five years. And the laws actually stipulate that the, the payment is supposed to be paid within six months. So you find a lot of people, they found themselves that they're being paid the money, which at that particular point in time, they're not useful because the cost of living has gone high. The equipments, the building materials are, are going high at that time, but they're being paid that kind of compensation. So it should be fully fair uh, and, 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 the, and the prompt compensation. And this is the role of uh, lawyers or in house counsel to assist this kind of clients. But also, the, on the aspect of involvement, we expect these lawyers to play a great, um, a, a great role in that um, they, uh, they help the, these clients who are. Actually, they're suffering from human rights abuse and are on aspect of air, water, and, uh, and water and, and water pollution, and on the issues of environmental and social environmental impact assessment or environmental and social impact assessment. Because um, when this assessment, for, for example, in Tanzania, I think it with other countries as well, that is supposed to be a consultative process. People should be involved and the community members should be involved in this kind of process. So lawyers, when they, uh, they're in place, they will be able to uh, educate and assist these people to be, there, there, to be consulted, fully consulted, and the consultation to be meaningful one. But also on human rights abuses, I thought about helping our lawyers should be in position to help this kind of victim, victims of discrimination, secured guards. I just put the secured guards, militarization, and contract disclosure. We have witnessed actually a lot of cases have been in this industry for more than 10 years and we witnessed a lot of people being affected by uh, water pollution, the spill of poisonous water in their farms, in their uh, water which is used for, for home consumptions and uh, some of them have been affected in different cases. We have different cases where people have been affected. So as a lawyers, uh, the aspect of environment they should be able to assist uh, this kind of victims to address these issues of concern on the air, water. Um, actually, I wanted to add about um, uh, the, 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 pollution, the water pollution, but also there's a noise pollution. I've repeated the issue of water, but I want to talk about the noise pollution because of, uh, I've encountered myself and I've assisted clients on these cases where a lot of noises are coming up from the mining because of the rock busting. 
and a lot of people end up being frustrated, getting discouraged, and all sorts of problems. So we thought that it, that the role of lawyers to assist these kind of victims. But also of the militarization, the use of security guards, because of, we have been having cases of where security guards are shooting people most of the time, and uh, when they shoot them, people, they don't have anywhere to go and complain. So once they complain, they need to get some lawyers, especially when they go to the court of law. But when they go to the legal system, sometimes they don't get that fully assistance. So we think lawyers, um, corporate lawyers, they should be able to assist this kind of people, particularly when there's a violation of human rights by military security and security guards who are guarding the mining who have been shooting people and causing a lot of injuries and sometimes even death. And um, another one is to facilitate the alignment of policies and legislation and government programs with international standards. Because um, this one cannot be done by other people rather than lawyers. Lawyers are the ones who are supposed to be a central, playing a central role in supporting and assisting and facilitating the alignment of policies and legislation and government programs with international standards. Because in most cases, um, for example, for us, business and human rights Tanzania, we've been actually consulted and we've been working with, um, with the Commission for Human Rights and Good Governance to develop um, a national action plan on business and human rights. And now we are actually, we have just completed the NBA, National Business Assessment, and now we're going, we are doing some consultations for the National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights. So I think another part of the role which we can play is to facilitate that uh, there is alignment of policies, legislation, government program, programs with international standards to enhance human rights standards in Tanzania and in African, East African home, as a whole. But also there is a lot of lawyers in ensuring that uh, the contracts are made open for, the, uh, for people to review, scrutinize them and provide redress. Because um, we've been having these cases now, um, I think tourists should be a witness with work on this. And we're trying to work on trying to make sure the contracts are open, at least to a certain extent where people can be able to view them, to, uh, to scrutinize them and see that if these contracts have got something which is going to offer to the country of Tanzania, or Africa, is Africa in general, to make sure that people they see what they're going to benefit and what how they can uh, get a, a benefit of it from this kind of contract. So we are trying to work on, and there's some process, we've seen some effort which is being made to make it to discuss this kind of contract, but we still need to be, the, the contract to be more close so that we can be able to, to, to scrutinize and provide some advice on the betterment of this contract. But also, avoiding human rights abuses, uh, illegal counselors, these are the people who are to actually assisted this kind of uh, victims and people and companies, businesses to avoid human rights abuses. We know that the company sometimes say, to me, I believe that sometimes they, I don't know if they don't know, but I believe that they need to be guided. Those, especially in our council, they need to direct um, and assist and guide those businesses to make sure that they avoid human rights abuses, particularly uh, to the community members of surrounding those kind of areas where the investment is situated. But also they have to, uh, as I've said, provide legal advice, but also to ensure that meaningful consultation on particular the issues of ethics, free, prior, and informed consent. There should be a meaningful consultation, but that should, the, the consent should be a, a, a obtained. We've seen in different cases where the, the, the actually the investment is being made, the consultation is not there, and they, even though the law provides for that, some cases in some countries or some areas, but you find that uh, a lot of people, they are like, they act as a rubber stamp. They just called and the announcement is made that uh, we're going to invest in this area, and then no questions, no queries and everything, and then the company starts to invest. And this makes a lot of complaints and there is a lot of issues which are happening in this area because people are not consulted, they don't even know their fate, and the, 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 the consultation actually is not always prior because it's supposed to be free prior, but in most cases it's not free, it's not prior. People just force themselves to accept what is happening without even questioning them. But also they should endure as a business to make sure that there's um, the, the work on a corruption-free zone. 
because we know the companies are um, actually very, very, uh, the, the corruption zone is, is easy to be corrupted and it's easy to corrupt. So we think for the companies uh, to make sure to do that, the lawyers should be in place to assist them to make sure that for them to be clean, but also to work, to have um, that kind of best practice, to work in a, uh, to, to have um, a good working environment to make sure that they are out of corruption. But also they have to take part in assessing and improving the law of enforcement capabilities, reviewing existing laws. And uh, we have seen TLS and some organization in the past and we are part of it. We actually did uh, took a very good role in viewing in trying to uh, provide some comments in the new um, legislation, which was passed under certificate of agent, agents. And then I think this is a role of lawyers to make sure that it doesn't matter how the the, 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 the are coming. It doesn't matter how the law is coming. We should be available to provide this kind of service and ensure that we, we are at the forefront of trying to review this kind of laws, but also to ensure that there is enforcement of laws and capabilities to, to make sure that human rights standards are being complied and that are there too. But also provide consultations and guidance for companies on how to respect human rights. We know the companies sometimes they take for granted or they want to take up advantage of the ignorance of the people. So we, we need to see that these uh, lawyers, uh, advocates, advocates or in our council, they're trying to the level best to make sure that their companies actually, they are the one who are in the forefront of respecting human rights standards. But also- oh, Flaviana, to, Flaviana yeah. can, I, can I say thank you very much? I'm just very wary of the time and we have got All another right. speaker. So if you want to just say something, to finish off, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Um, I just want to, to finish that um, um, company complying with the laws, businesses are complying with the laws, and lawyers being able to assist them to comply with laws and policies and legislation in is quite it's a, it's a good practice for them. He actually gives them a reputation, particularly on the issues of trying to overcome the issue of losing their job. Because most of the time, the company is scared of losing their, their profit. So when they comply with the laws and the policy, they play a good, a good card. And they're in a position to make sure that uh, they, they operate in a good environment, but they create a sense of ownership with the community members. Hence, they have this kind of accept, uh, acceptance from the community members. So um, I, just, I, I want, just want to say thank you so much. I think we have a presentation we can share with the other people. Thank you so much for that. Thank you indeed, Flaviana. Um, yep. Now, let's move very swiftly then to our next speaker, um, who is uh, Masood Salim Mohammed. Uh, Masood um, is a corporate lawyer at uh, Syed Attorney and Associates, which is based in Zanzibar. Um, and he will be providing a corporate governance perspective by looking at the role of in-house counsel in navigating these uh, legal challenges. Masood. Thank you very much, uh, Yasmin. Um, I accept the 10 minute marathon challenge. <laughs> uh, and that said, I think the first uh, slide on uh, outline, I'll skip that. Uh, let me start with two quick short stories. Um, 10 years ago, I went for a job interview with one of the uh, telecommunication companies. And I was asked by the interviewer, what is the most important thing for a company? So 10 years ago, my answer was honesty. I think I would say the same thing today. The interviewer told me honestly that Masood, I like your answer, but that is not what the board wants to hear. Now, last year, I was in London at the International uh, Petroleum Week conference, and I heard something very interesting from one of the executives from of one of the majors, uh, oil majors. On the sideline of the conference, he said, he was, we were talking about uh, the paradigm change, uh, paradigm shift, and he told us about how today, they're getting indirect voice, voices influencing the decisions of the board. And he talked about how every time he goes home, his eight-year-old daughter 
can't stop bothering him about you oil guys, you are uh, messing up our world. So we're in a changing world. And I think as lawyers, corporate lawyers, we need to be uh, aware of that. Now, why responsible business practice in Tanzania? Um, this is very important because uh, it will precipitate an inclusive uh, growth and sustainable growth. And that is what uh, we want. Actually, that is in line with the SDGs. And not only that, it is in line with our own national uh, five-year plan, uh, Tanzania mainland and the uh, Zanzibar strategy for growth and reduction of poverty. Um, this will increase uh, business, responsible business practice and therefore a compliance and confidence in the country, which in the end, our country becomes attractive and ultimately there'll be more revenues and there'll be better services uh, for all of us, for our citizens. Uh, next one, please. So whose responsibility is it to uphold uh, business uh, best practices in business it's very simple it's all of us because if i don't own a business i am working with a business as a lawyer or i'm a patron for a business and it should be in our interest to understand and to want to know if those people those companies we're dealing with are actually uh, practicing responsible business so it's on on all of us Next one, I'm fired up for my marathon. Now, legal perspective. Um, the laws, of course, they affect everything. Tanzania has uh, some of the best pieces of legislations. And, and most of these legislations, uh, they uh, have provisions for responsible uh, business. Uh, so obviously, uh, companies act, lays a strong foundation and strong ground for uh, these practices. And that is both uh, Companies Act on the mainland Tanzania and Companies Act in uh, Zanzibar. Now we have Petroleum, uh, Petroleum Act, Petroleum Regulations of 2019. They have come up, um, they've enshrined this uh, uh, integrity pledge. And this is very important and companies are required uh, at very many level uh, to submit and to sign uh, that pledge. And this is all about encouraging uh, companies to uphold very high standards of uh, integrity. But further within the extractive industry, which is um, attracting a lot of attention in Tanzania, we have uh, the Extractive Industry um, Transparency Act. And that under section 16 sub one provides for um, disclosure of agreements. But again, uh, and I think Flaviana talked on this, uh, touched on this, again, uh, those provisions are one thing, but implementation uh, is quite, uh, quite another. And unfortunately, Tanzania is um, uh, reported by the Resource Governance Index as one of the countries in Africa with the best laws, but unfortunately, it, it's also in the list of countries that fail to uh, implement its own laws. Uh, next one. Uh, the corporate perspective. I, I quite like this uh, quote. Uh, it can be said without much oversimplification simplification, that there are no underdeveloped countries. There are only undermanaged ones. So management in this corporate perspective is so very critical. Next one, please. So the corporate perspective, um, every country has its own background. In the case of Tanzania, uh, corporate governance was uh, driven uh, not by serious collapse, economic or financial. Um, and that, is this, that distinguishes us from most of the countries, especially in the West. But there is a vast uh, amount of interest in parastatals. And then, again, that goes to the background of this country um, with socialism and the huge influence that parastatals have played in the economy. To date, there is no 
uh, a national integrated code of corporate governance. But from one of the key sources I spoke to yesterday, they're working on it and hopefully next, mid next year, we will have um, uh, that national code. So company law continue to uh, provide uh, the basis for corporate governance. But we also have the capital markets and security authorities guidelines. They apply to banks and listed companies. And then we have the Bank of Tanzania uh, guidelines of 2008. Um, a, a voluntary code of corporate governance is highly desirable because as we've seen, laws are there, but implementation is quite another thing. And so if we have those voluntary, uh, the voluntary code that lawyers can encourage their companies uh, to, uh, to follow, to voluntarily follow, which ultimately is good for the companies. Next one, before Yasmin comes for me. Um, some key challenges. So most of the companies in this country are still family owned. These are family businesses. Um, and therefore you have managers who double as uh, shareholders. There is a uh, of disclosure uh, in, those in those companies. And even though so often we all want to point to those foreign companies for disclosure, but what are we doing in our own companies? I think that's an interesting question for us lawyers and those businesses. Uh, there's serious potential for uh, conflicts of interest, uh, inadequate competence uh, in the boards, uh, commitment of director is an issue, obviously uh, agency problem, um, and short-sighted uh, sightedness on profit maximization, which is uh, a worldwide problem, unfortunately. Uh, next one. So the role of lawyers, very quickly. Uh, I think the role of lawyer is very uh, critical. Um, and for us to discharge our duties properly, we need to invest in ourselves. We need to become conversant with those areas in which we practice so we can convey, convince our, uh, our clients that it is in their best interest. Uh, company secretaries and in-house counsels, we have uh, a, a paramount and important role in uh, guiding the companies, our clients from the day go. Um, we need to serve as gatekeepers and, um, you know, to, uh, to conclude, I would say a good lawyer should also be, this is a quote, should also be a, a professional and public citizen and be concerned not just with the best interest of his or her client, but the greatest good for the greatest number. Uh, we can do this with help from our senior lawyers. I cannot overemphasize the role of uh, our mentoring from senior lawyers because every legal challenge we go through today, they have been there. Thank you very much for uh, listening and your attention. Thank you very much indeed, Masood. And what a great point to end on. Fine. In that case, uh, can I ask you, Flaviana, to just feed back on the group discussion that we had, please. That would be helpful. Thank you so much, Yasmin. And thank you so much for my group for uh, being active and trying to contribute on human rights due diligence. Actually, what we got from our group, well, number one, it was about um, knowing that the, uh, the company should know that angels are working around the area, but um, all over the world. And they are watching it. They're watching the company, their ads, and their conduct. So they should be have the have to care about their reputations, but to ensure that um, they avoid the human rights abuse. So all over the world, the NGOs are working hard, and they're busy watching the ads of the company. So the companies should behave and try to show, ensure that their reputation are being maintained. But the most important thing to make sure that the human rights abuse or violation of human rights is being avoided at any expense. But also, I like the, we had a point that uh, we need to have a, uh, we must have a proper dialogue to ensure that human rights are avoided at any expense. So the proper dialogue between the companies and the community members should be the key because when there is a consultation or any kind of um, uh, involvement, the engagement with the community members, the dialogue, is always quite key to make sure that the company is going to operate 
in an environment that uh, is safe, but also is beneficial to the community members. But also we um, had a point that um, the company should avoid problems, not um, because when they cause problem, uh, they end up ruining their reputation which they have built for over the years. So they should know any act which they have it has adverse impacts to their reputation, but also their profit, but also to the community members. So it's, 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 it's good to choose to behave when try to abide human rights standard. But also the, we had a point that um, the company should um, try to, uh, to make sure that in the cases of acquisition of land um, and the uh, involvement of employment, um, they should make sure that they protect and promote human rights, but also they have to protect, they, to ensure that they, they, they establish relationship and protect with the company, it's, uh, with the community members and the government. Because the relationship brings a sense of ownership of the businesses. So it's quite important that uh, the due the diligence is quite important because we're talking about the importance of the due diligence. It's quite important because it's going to help to avoid this kind of consequence when they try it, it, when they try to, to 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 work on due diligence process in a in a in a reasonable and uh, and proper way, but also the NGO all over the world, um, as I say, that is watching. So they should behave that uh, like the people, the, the company they should behave in such a way that uh, they know that their people are watching and they care so much about what they are doing, especially on the human rights. So the importance of it is going to make them to work in a good environment, but to make sure that they have. These people were backing them up when they're working and um, uh, abiding to the human rights standards. But due diligence is quite important because there's um, someone has said that it's quite important because these companies are being managed by human beings. And a human being, these are the ones who are their human rights need to be maintained and to be promoted. So all the time, if you violate human rights, because not, then you're leading yourself to, um, to some programs. So making sure that this human being who are leading and managing the company, making sure that the company is going to gain a lot of profit, but then their human rights standard be, be maintained. But also we had another uh, quite important, which um, someone has shared that um, the companies, um, the business touches the life of people. So having this kind of um, human rights diligence, which involves assessment of impact, integrating it and communicating, communicating it, it will um, make sure that that adverse impact which is expected to the company, like what happened in North Mara in Tanzania, is not going to happen again. So they should take a matter of human rights as a core center of their business. It should be core of their business. So okay. this was um, some of the few contributions from our group. And I humbly submit. And thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Flavia. <laughs> yes, when you were there, you, you had a lot of points. <laughs> I am indeed. No, I have resubmit. I have tried to be in time. Thank you so much. Okay, thank, thank you. you. All really right, appreciate so it. Thank I'd you. like to now bring in um, Stuart, who is in group two and spoke about legal frameworks. Stuart, would you like to come in? Thank you, uh, Yasmin. It sounds like we had an equally vibrant discussion. Uh, it was really wonderful. So thank you to, to everyone in our group for participating. Uh, Elinami has kindly agreed to be our spokesperson. Uh, although I think Daniel, uh, you know, uh, and Amelia and others who contributed, if you want to chip in as well, uh, please do. But Elinami, do, do you want to give the highlights of what we discussed? Thank you very much, Stuart. Uh, I had some problem in hearing every point. I'm trying to share what I was capable of capturing from the discussion. Actually, we had uh, uh, discussing the legal framework. We had uh, this uh, a brainstorm of questions on uh, international law, domestic laws, and again we talked of uh, binding law and uh, voluntary way of uh, holding this response to human rights, and what we did say a group we said uh, it's important that we have uh, code laws it's very important we code for laws so that it's easy to hold the company accountable on the existing legal framework but again we based on that said it's, it's important that we have uh, 
those laws should be disseminated to the stakeholders that the issue is not uh, it's not uh, uh, not in the it's, it's not like uh, punishes business but actually helping them to appreciate the importance of protecting human rights and uh, then we also had some discussion on uh, taking an example for UK and France if we can actually in Tanzania and Africa adapt the fact that uh, business companies legal uh, uh, businesses, if they can develop uh, their own human rights plan, and once they are uh, or they infringe uh, some of those of their own actions, anybody who is affected by the acts is capable of taking them to to the law enforcement uh, machinery. Uh, so the discussion was that is important. It can be. It can be well applied in but again, this uh, the, 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 will they be able to understand those action plans? Uh, companies write action and take them, uh, hold them accountable when they, they violate. That should be the question which was answered. We also uh, say the, the, the business. Uh, the business companies or business entities should have uh, 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 their own ethical or, or uh, right uh, standards for them to adhere to. Uh, but our final speaker made something very important that the independent accountability mechanism is key in, uh, in assuring uh, the responsible uh, uh, business entities when it comes to human rights uh, production. Thank you very much indeed. Actual water was capable of capturing Stuart have some addition to that or that Daniel. Was, I, that was brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. I just Elinami, that was brilliant. And I think that one of the key things, I know Yasmin, you need to move on, but I liked a particular quote from Daniel, which was about empowering the public. So when we spoke about the different options between the UK Mon Slavery Act and the French duty vigilance law. We quite like the idea that the public can be empowered to look at a company's own published action plan and then if the company falls short of those standards, um, bringing, bringing action. Um, the group is very much in favor of um, clear mandatory standards, but also with guidance to help businesses understand what those, what those standards mean. And then as, as um, Ananami mentioned, Amelia made a point at the end about there must be um, the ability to enforce, and so there must be an independent regulator who can look at when companies have fallen short of the, of the required standards. It was a lovely discussion. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Stuart, and thank you. Um, can I then move on to group three, um, who are looking at the challenges, particularly faced by lawyers and in-house counsel, in promoting responsible business practices? Um, now, that was being led by um, Masoud, Masoud, are you speaking or is there someone else who's going to be um, feeding back from your session, please? Welcome. Uh, yeah, I think we lost our uh, spokesperson, so I will volunteer. Um, so obviously, as it was expected, uh, issues of labor, labor issues uh, were high on our discussion. Um, and one of the challenges uh, discussed was uh, you have uh, a labor matter before uh, the Commission for Mediation and Arbitration, um, but here you have a, a client who's outside of Tanzania and they're unable to travel uh, to Tanzania to be here in person. Uh, and whereas you could uh, uh, procure uh, an affidavit, but it is not the same as uh, having your client come in person. In, you know, help provide that uh, uh, evidence uh, and, and build for, uh, for a strong case. Uh, and so uh, one of the questions was, um, yes, there's been video conferencing, but uh, moving forward, uh, what uh, can the uh, commission and judiciary in general uh, learn from this um, uh, crisis and take it 
uh, in the future to uh, maybe other situations. Uh, another uh, hot issue was, um, you know, lawyers uh, don't live on an island and just like this crisis has hit the finance of all other professionals and everybody. So lawyers also felt the brunt. Um, and then obviously the question become, how do you uh, go and um, uh, defend a case uh, for someone who's uh, claiming for their wages, whereas you yourself, um, you're facing those problems. Um, so maybe I think uh, I'm just adding this, maybe lawyers in the future uh, or should have been classified as essential workers uh, because a lot of people are there that depend on us. But we also learned of an experience on how uh, transportation was uh, affected. Uh, from a colleague of uh, Kenya Maritime. Uh, and this is a little bit similar to that case where you have someone abroad and they cannot come. So you have the seafarers uh, out and maybe the contract expires, but, and yet they cannot come back uh, to the country. So uh, transport was um, heavily, and therefore lawyers uh, working in that sector were heavily affected. Uh, there was also, uh, the issue of uh, data uh, infringement, uh, that was uh, a challenge seen by some of our, our colleagues, lawyers and in-house and practicing advocates. And the last one, um, it's about contracts. So contracts have been uh, um, uh, affected, contracts have, have been um, uh, terminated or forced to be terminated, uh, sometimes without following the proper procedure. And so you have the company, you have a contractor, but the subcontractor is forced by this situation to act in a manner that does not necessarily follow procedures and that could bring um, uh, implications to um, uh, the contractor. So one of the conclusions on that point is that um, we will continue to see the implications um, uh, and impact of this uh, crisis for many, many years uh, uh, to come as there'll be that chain of uh, um, uh, unprocedural, there'll be a chain of challenges. Thank you very much. Uh, group, I think I've uh, covered what we discussed. If there's anything I forgot, feel free to jump in. If Yasmin let you, thank you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Masud. That was very helpful, thank you. Um, I am aware that we are now starting to go over time, so if you all bear with us, we still have two groups to feedback. Um, first of all, we've got trends um, in group four. We're discussing uh, what the key trends were in the area of responsible business in um, Tanzania. So Slim, can I ask you either to come and speak to it or at least someone who's in your group who has been tasked to do so? Uh, thank you, Yasmin. I think I, I can do it because it's a very, very long uh, um, um, uh, submission. Uh, generally, first of all, on our side, we have to uh, conclude that our question is very, very complex compared to the rest. So we are trying to think hard and hard on how to tackle the question given. Anyway, um, we uh, unanimously agree that um, the trend in Tanzania comparing to, um, because Tanzania is a union between two um, jurisdictions, that is um, mainland Tanzania and, 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 and Zanzibar. But uh, we've tried to uh, compare the, the case uh, between um, within uh, recent 10 years. And the trend has uh, proved to be very, 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 very good. For instance, uh, by taking the example of the uh, uh, recent laws in gas and oil um, in Zanzibar, and uh, with the uh, analysis made by the um, by uh, uh, one member from the group, he uh, he has um, informed us that uh, the coverage of the uh, the new legislature is very is very fair, and the areas like uh, such as comp compensation for the people affected by the 
um, gas and oil projects and uh, have been all, um, well covered. And the issue of sharing of, of benefits between the um, companies and the local people around the areas, the issue of uh, environment, as you know, uh, the issue of gas and oil always attract the issue of environmental uh, concern. And uh, as a result, uh, uh, the law seems to be very much, um, um, very, very much fair. And we're looking forward that uh, once the exploration commence, especially in Zanzibar, for instance, uh, um, the complaint from the uh, pressure group and uh, uh, society in general will be, will be very much minimized. And that is to say, um, uh, um, 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 economic activities in this area would prove to be um, very much um, um, balanced between the, the, the companies and, and the community around, the, um, around Zanzibar. On the issue, of, on the case of from Tanzania mainland, which, uh, current, which is currently in witnessing a major project in infrastructure and um, um, gas and oil um, exploration, uh, um, we have a very, very minimized cases from the um, uh, these NGOs and uh, communities. That is to say, um, the issue of human rights has been uh, properly covered in comparison to, uh, to 10 years before the, the recent times. So technically, the trend seems to be um, very good, and we're looking forward that uh, the situation will um, be more, much more advanced for the uh, benefit of the, these multinational companies and the strategic life. Thank you, Aslan. Thank you very much indeed, Slim. That was great. Um, now uh, we have um, the last um, feedback, which was on peer-to-peer -peer learning, um, which Hannington's group was um, going to be feeding back on. Now, Har Hannington, I know you are now with us. Can you indicate whether or not you're feeding back or there's someone from your group feeding back, please? Thank you so much, Yasmin. Michaela from the group is feeding back. Michaela, please be brief. Two minutes should be enough. Brilliant, thank you. Hi, everyone. This is Michaela Marandu from Hilius Towers. Michaela, um, Karibu. Asante. So there are a couple of uh, comments and questions that we observed in our group. To begin with, um, we, are, we would like to understand the link or connection between BHR and business or corporates, because for some of us, this is a new concept. Um, we think that it's important for university and college students to have um, BHR incorporated into their curriculum. We want to understand whether um, uh, in the East African jurisdiction, BHR and specifically internationally recognized BHR has been incorporated into the East African jurisdiction um, and into local law. And to what extent uh, international human rights bodies are working towards achieving this. We think that it's important for Tanzanian lawyers to you know, receive some kind of mentorship or uh, be involved in exchange programs with the UK counterpart. Um, and also, this can be done either in Tanzania or outside of Tanzania. We would like to know um, how does business HR affect micro and small medium enterprises, as well as small and medium enterprises. Uh, we think it's important for lay people and ordinary people to also get educated on uh, business HR. Uh, we'd like to know what challenges uh, you would foresee if this initiative was taken forward. And the last one is, we think it's important to understand or differentiate um, between CSR and business HR, specifically for corporates who uh, take advantage of CSR as being uh, BHR. That's all for me. Lovely. Thank you so much, uh, Michaela. Now, I just want to ask, um, Hannington, do you want to have one minute to just say, um, give a closing remark, or do you want me to just carry on, finish this? How would you like to play this? Uh, uh, Yasmin, I just want to appreciate each of every participant in this meeting. 
uh, I really appreciate that they dedicated their time, they stayed the course. And to our colleagues uh, from the UK, Masood, uh, Flavia, for really finding time to dedicate this kind of energy towards a pro bono service. I look forward to again meeting this team soon as we advance other capacity building. Thank you so much. Thanks very much indeed, um, Astrid. So we are now at the very end, um, sorry, uh, Huntington. Uh, we are now at the very end of the webinar, which I do hope all of you found informative and also thought provoking. Now I'd like to say a very, very big thank you to our speakers for their insightful contributions to Hannington, uh, Slim, Stuart, Flaviana, and of course, Masood. Thank you for sharing your experiences, your knowledge, and thoughts with us on what has after all been a very important area and is becoming increasingly so. Um, I would also like to thank you, our wonderful audience, for joining us today to putting uh, up with all the little problems we've had with technology and to keep staying with us uh, now, uh, even though we've gone over time. Um, and I do hope also that you enjoyed your contributions in the breakout sessions. Now I'm going to leave you with a final thought, which is to say that responsible business is good business and good business is profitable. So on that note, I close this event. Asana Sante. <laughs>